In recent years, some of the most incredible finds in paleontology have been coming from specimens of amber preserving parts of or even entire organisms in a level of detail never seen before. Recently, a specimen believed to contain the tiny head of a new species of avian dinosaur was published on in the journal Nature, one of the world's most respected and top academic journals. This discovery was a huge deal in the paleontological world, but soon after its publication some very troubling information came to light concerning the circumstances of the amber's discovery and acquisition by the paleontologists. Added to this are doubts over the true identity of the creature preserved within the amber specimen, with it now not even being certain that this really is a dinosaur, creating one of the biggest controversies in the field in recent years. The animal in the amber was named Oculodentavis cangrae by the researchers in their initial description, and under the original interpretation of this organism as an avian dinosaur, it has some significant implications for bird evolutionary history. The amber is estimated to be about 99 million years old, and comes from northern Myanmar. Estimating the full body length of the animal from just the 7.1mm long skull gives a size of about 9cm, including a long tail, when fully grown, putting this alleged avian on the same scale as some of the smallest living hummingbirds and making it one of the smallest dinosaurs ever discovered. Based on the shape of the teeth and the eyes, it's thought to have been a daylight predator of small arthropods, living and climbing amongst the trees of its forest environment and potentially also spending time hunting on the ground. The evolutionary placement given by the paleontologists in their initial description puts Oculodentavis as just one step more derived than the famed Archaeopteryx, which would mean that this represents one of the most ancient bird lineages we currently know of. It also implies that not long after birds first appeared, some of them immediately reduced in size to the minuscule dimensions of this species. An interesting and unexpected idea, suggesting a ghost lineage of eventually tiny avians that first evolved about 150 million years ago, and persisted for a long time throughout the Mesozoic. This would also mean that presumably there are a lot of very small, archaic avians we just don't have the fossils of since they were too tiny to preserve well, an idea that could change our entire perception of the age of dinosaurs, as it could be that the many different ecosystems were filled with little members of the Oculodentavis lineage and we just haven't been able to tell that they're there yet. With no context behind its origins, the fossil itself is absolutely stunning and a truly remarkable find. Not only is the skull essentially perfectly preserved, but the authors also refer to a preserved brain and even a tongue, opening up all sorts of possibilities for amazing future studies. However, it would be wrong to only appreciate the fossil when the context is so significant and is intertwined in such a way with human suffering. As I briefly mentioned, Oculodentavis comes from Myanmar, as have many of the recent stunning amber finds, including a lizard, a dinosaur tail, a baby snake, an unusual bird foot, and all kinds of remarkable insects and bits of plants. But the situation in this country is a complex one. I won't pretend to understand everything that's going on in this part of the world, though I can explain why many paleontologists now feel that studying and publishing on Myanmar amber specimens is unethical. It was only quite recently, in 2019, that the true extent of the role that the amber trade plays in the region's conflict became more widely known to the paleontological world. And before then, and even just before Oculodentavis was described, many people, including myself, were unaware of the horrific situation that Burmese amber is embroiled in. The richest amber mines are in Kachin State in northern Myanmar, and the reported conditions faced by the workers of these mines are pretty appalling. For many decades these mines were quite shallow, however in more recent years, to get to the very best sources of amber, some mines have been dug down to as deep as 100 meters. The narrow shafts of the mines are so small that it's often teenagers who are made to dig them, and tens of thousands of people in total worked in the Kachin mines. But the mines are incredibly dangerous, with floods and cave-ins killing hundreds of people every month, and no healthcare or compensation for the families was given. In addition, the area is in the middle of a conflict between the Kachin Independence Army and the Myanmar Army. This makes the region an even more dangerous place to work, with the alleged use of landmines and child soldiers by both sides and other horrific acts of violence being not uncommon in this part of the world. So what does amber have to do with this? Well, once an amber specimen with a fossil inclusion has been mined, they are often transported and then smuggled over the border into China, where they end up being sold in a market in Tengchong. It's at this market that some paleontologists will occasionally purchase scientifically important specimens for study. Knowing how valuable these specimens are to scientists, they will usually be sold for hundreds, possibly even thousands or tens of thousands of dollars depending on the inclusion. Of course, most of the amber, with or without inclusions, goes on to be made into jewellery, and the amber industry in China is incredibly valuable, with estimates putting its worth at a billion dollars. 
In 2017, the Myanmar army took control of the places where the amber mines are located, with UN reports indicating that these actions killed four people and trapped up to 5,000 in the area. The UN has also called for the top generals of the Myanmar army to be investigated for genocide on account of their overall actions in the region. Some sources seem to indicate that the army has resumed the mining of amber in the areas they now control, or at least are going to resume soon, but others say the deepest mines have now been closed, with only shallower mines and perhaps some secret ones still going. However, the concern for paleontologists is that the purchasing of amber specimens could be funding the violence in Myanmar. It's difficult to determine exactly how much the money made from amber goes on to fund the Myanmar army or the other ethnic militias, but since the amber specimens are so valuable to scientists, it's definitely an issue. Some paleontologists have now completely refused to work on Burmese amber at all, or even to review papers about such specimens, and are encouraging a boycott in order to try and stop that money from fueling the violence in Kachin. It's still an ethical grey area for many researchers at the moment, and since this has all only quite recently been revealed, there are no guidelines yet from paleontological associations as to how amber from Myanmar should be treated. Is it right to continue working on and celebrating these amber specimens? I'm not here to make that decision for anyone, but as Mark Witten says in his excellent blog post on the topic, the best thing we can do is make sure the context of Myanmar fossils is shared as widely as possible, so people can make their own judgement about the ethics and morals of sharing and promoting this story. So that's why I decided to make this video. As for the actual identification of Oculu Dentavis, as I mentioned earlier, this has also come into question. Overall, the skull does have a very bird-like look, with a long snout, big eye sockets and a rounded cranium. However, there are several key features that have led other paleontologists to doubt whether it really is a dinosaur. For example, the skull completely lacks an opening known as the antorbital fenestra. This is a characteristic that even living birds have at least traces of in their skulls, but in Oculo dentavis there's no trace left of such an opening. The authors explained this as being due to the miniaturization of the skull, however even the smallest of living hummingbirds still retain the antorbital fenestra, though lizards lack these openings of the skull. Additionally, the geometry of the teeth is very different to dinosaurs. While dinosaurs have a thecodont condition, in which the bases of the teeth are enclosed in a socket of bone, Oculu dentavis possesses an acrodont to pleurodont condition, with no grooves or sockets but instead having teeth growing from the surfaces or sides of the jaws, like in lizards. The shape of the ossicles in the scleral ring is also very lizard-like, being quite long and spoon-shaped. The paper even states that, a morphology similar to this is otherwise known only in lizards, for example, Lacerta viridis. So, another weird characteristic for a dinosaur to have. The huge number of teeth is also very unusual for birds, and the way the dentition extends on below the orbit for quite a way is strange, but these are common features in lizards. Another thing that's been brought up is how such a small size would, indeed, be very unusual for a bird, especially such an archaic one, but it wouldn't be so out of the ordinary for a lizard. Some living species, such as chameleons and the genus Bradypodion, can have skulls between 4.5mm to 6.4mm long, even smaller than Oculo dentavis's skull at 7.1mm. It's also been pointed out that it's a little unusual for no feathers to have been preserved in this amber specimen, since the preservation otherwise is so good. Of course that's not definite proof of a non-dinosaur identification, but it doesn't help support the original placement. There's even a tiny patch of what appear to be scales preserved near the back of the head, but it's not certain that these scales are actually from the same animal. So, Oculo dentavis has turned out to be a very interesting case. I'm sure that more research is bound to be published on this organism soon, and we might get a clearer idea of its true identity as a dinosaur, lizard, or perhaps something else. But I hope that the more important human and ethical issues surrounding the research of this fossil and others from Myanmar will be addressed by paleontological associations. Obviously the ideal outcome would be for all violence and conflict in the region to cease, but failing that I hope that any future discussions or publications of amber discoveries from this part of the world will make sure to include the wider context of the terrible conditions surrounding their origin. Of course it would be awful if once in a lifetime paleontological discoveries are lost due to Myanmar amber being boycotted, and there is also the argument to be made that if paleontologists don't buy the fossils then they'll just end up as jewellery anyway, but when there's such a high human price it's something we should consider very seriously. I know making a video about this situation isn't really going to do anything in the grand scheme of things, but I felt like I had to do something after reading about the appalling suffering that other people have had to go through and that has gone largely unrecognised due to the shadow cast by the excitement of dramatic new fossil discoveries. This isn't to say you should feel guilty for being excited about the remarkable amber finds from Myanmar, I know I was, but now that you're aware of the circumstances, I hope it's something you'll keep in mind. 
Anyway, I hope you were somewhat able to enjoy this video and learn something new. A big thank you to our Patreon supporters, especially our Dinosaur Tier supporters Nicole Bueno, Dominic Bathy, and Puschetti TV. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.